I know this channel is typically known for platformer series, but in the case of Horizon Forbidden West, the sequel to the 2017 open world hit Horizon Zero Dawn, I'm willing to make an exception. As a post-apocalyptic Earth that's mysteriously overrun with giant robotic animals and the fact that you can hunt them with various weapons, including their own, definitely fits right in with PlayStation's extensive library of IPs that ranges from sci-fi shooters like Ratchet and Clank to more cinematic adventures like Uncharted. But even though the original Horizon Zero Dawn was a massive success, selling over 20 million copies worldwide across PS4 and PC as of February 11th of this year, whatever your stance on the game is, it's almost universally agreed upon that Zero Dawn, despite how good the game was, had some really apparent problems no matter where you went. Melee combat wasn't very useful, the amount of climbable surfaces was limited, rewards for side quests didn't make completing them very satisfying, and of course, a vast majority of the cutscenes are just like, well, this. The caravan sent me. The caravan? What caravan? The one you sabotaged. I get that this was the studio's first attempt at an open world game, and that it takes time to make every single one of these feel unique. It's acceptable at most, but other times it's just so noticeably jarring that you almost can't acknowledge this problem without talking about the first game. Thankfully, the game's expansion DLC, The Frozen Wilds, didn't suffer as badly from these issues, as exchanges in dialogue felt more like actual cutscenes, side quests were definitely more rewarding, with new gear being obtained by doing them. It was definitely a step in the right direction, as you could tell that the developers at Guerrilla were doing all they could to make the returning trip even better than the initial game, which is even more apparent in the game's now-released sequel, Horizon Forbidden West, as all of the problems of the original game have been acknowledged and vastly improved upon, while adding much, and I emphasize, much more content to the overall game. So much, actually, that after leaving the Daunt, which is the main opening section of the map, it was with these first steps into the Forbidden West that I realized I was already overwhelmed. Like, where do I go first? What should be the first things I do in order to level up fast. This sense of anxiety comes from the way I play open world games with RPG elements, like Marvel's Spider-Man, wherein I'll do everything possible at that point in the game to get as leveled up as possible before progressing further into the story because I know things will only get harder the further I manage to get. This goes for more linear games like Ratchet and Clank as well. But everything Gorilla managed to put into this game, it all manages to come together to create an almost perfect sequel and one of the best open world games I've ever played to be honest. And just a heads up, I will not be talking about any story-related spoilers, nor will I be talking about the few bugs that I've encountered during my playthroughs, because as of this video's recording and release, the team is still releasing patches to put the game in a much better state than it was at launch. Oh, uh, are you okay there, buddy? Uh, here, let me help you out. There you go, you're free. Jokes aside, it's almost been two months since the game's release, and today, I'm gonna go over seven reasons why Horizon Forbidden West is the near-perfect sequel and why it's one of the best gameplay experiences I've had the pleasure of playing. Starting off with number one, it's the game's overall graphics. Now, let's be completely honest here. The original Zero Dawn was heavily praised for its lush and beautiful graphics quality, with everything from the plants, the distant landscapes, and pretty much everything in between, including the weather, looking like one of the absolute best examples of what the previous generation of consoles could offer at the time. Okay, most of the dialogue sections and water graphics aside, it was still a nice game to look at. Maybe except for those two things. 
In Forbidden West's case, the team went above and beyond to make this game look even better than Zero Dawn. The water details have been vastly improved, the lighting is so much better, and there just seems to be so much more color this time around, alongside better character models and dialogue sections. Did I mention that this is just the base PS4 version, and that it still looks impressive? Sure, the PS5 version looks better in comparison, but I still found myself constantly impressed regardless of that fact. And number two is the improved traversal system. It's no secret that Guerrilla Games made this point one of the most crystal clear details about this game leading up to release. Yes, climbing is a lot more free in this game. Not Breath of the Wild free, but it's definitely more forgiving than Zero Dawn. I'll still find myself cheesing my way around from time to time by jumping onto surfaces I'm not really supposed to get onto, but hey, it gets the job done. They actually made highlighting the spots linked to the R free button, but I found it to be rather annoying and leaving me more worried about my stick wearing out faster. So I switched for climbing annotations to always be on, and life's been so much easier ever since. There's a new wall jumping mechanic, and while it does get the job done, in a realistic sense, when there's nothing close enough to directly grab onto, I can only recall actually using it twice, at most. It's that underused, especially when looking at games like Ratchet and Clank that made regular use of it. However, it's the new pool caster and shield wing tools that take the main spotlight in terms of traversal, with the former being used to speed up the process of climbing up cliff sides, provided there's a special connection to latch onto and or spring off of like Spider-Man. It also comes in handy for solving puzzles or clearing debris blocking your path. It even helps you get an edge in combat, kinda like in Ratchet and Clank Rift Apart, but the machine's improved AI in this game are pretty intent on keeping you from staying up high for long periods of time. So if you're gonna do something, you gotta do it quick. Otherwise, it's gonna get destroyed. While the shield wing is used as a faster way of getting down to a lower location without having to spend all that time climbing back down or just plain cheesing your way through something, sometimes in combination with the pool caster, which honestly never gets old, and it's even funner when you combine these two mechanics with the overridden sunwing you can get later on into the game's story. You ever get stuck in between a rock breaker and a hard place? Just call your sunwing to pull you out of air, or just pool cast yourself over to it and get to a safer spot to reevaluate your situation. But there's no denying just how much fun there is to be had just gliding around and taking in the scenery. Sure, you could glide around in Breath of the Wild, but it wasn't as satisfying given you had a limited amount of time and stamina to use it, and the ride just wasn't very satisfying as a result. Not to mention, it's got nothing on the Sunwing, so I think we know who the clear winner is here. At number three, it's better puzzles. Now, to be clear, the original Zero Dawn didn't have much in the way of puzzles. I mean, they were there, and they were pretty basic at most. Definitely not that memorable whatsoever. The same can be said about the game's cauldrons, as they were pretty much the exact same experience as the rest of the game every single time. You fight your way through a bunch of machines, do some basic platforming, fight the big one at the end, and you get access to brand new machine overrides. And that was pretty much it. In Forbidden West, puzzles have a lot more variety, they're more plentiful, and they require a good bit of thinking to accomplish, which makes them so much more satisfying to do. Even though my experiments of ludicrously stacking crates on top of one another for almost five minutes inside a relic ruin didn't work out as planned, it's that feeling when you finally figured out the proper way of solving it is what makes it all worthwhile, almost in the vein of the Uncharted games. And speaking of Uncharted, there's even a story mission later into the game that I won't spoil that legit feels like an Uncharted set piece. It's awesome. But when you get the opportunity to light up the night sky with what these Relic Ruin puzzles award you with, it isn't just rewarding, but it helps add even more life to the game's world. Which brings me to point number four, 
the world just feels more alive and less constrained compared to that of Zero Dawn and even its Frozen Wilds DLC. Settlements are more active with the various inhabitants of each feeling more like a part of a real location due to the game's more advanced crowd system. Rather than everybody just walking around on a scripted path like in Zero Dawn, which leads to a lot more deeper interactions and connections with various townsfolk, quest characters, and returning characters from the first game, many of which are connected to side quests where you get more meaningful rewards for actually doing them like new weapons and outfits, which honestly beats getting a bunch of random things that you likely had no use for in Zero Dawn, and it kinda encourages you to do almost all of them, just to see what each one has in store, with the ones revolving around Aloy's friends easily being some of the best side missions in the entire game. We should do it more often. <sighs> Come on. But the settlements aren't just the only things that are filled with more life. It's also the game's new machines. Compared to Zero Dawn, the machines in Forbidden West have a lot more personality put into them. The Burrower and Leap Lasher are the two that immediately stand out when it comes to machine personality, and are actually some of the first machines that you'll come across in the game as the former behaves like a weasel or an otter, given it can dig underground and also swim underwater. But sometimes, you'll see these things pop their heads out of the ground, which, in all honesty, is really cute, alongside the noises they tend to make. And heck, even when they're throwing rocks, there's just so much personality put into it, and I simply can't get enough of it. While the Leap Lasher is pretty much a kangaroo, and seeing as Australian wildlife are among my favorite animals in the world, you could probably imagine my face when I first seen this thing, and just how lively and almost cartoonish its jumping attack animations are, which probably explains why I keep getting hit by it almost every time I come across it, cause I can't help but appreciate all the little details. I also can't forget to bring up the game's expanded and improved weather system. Sandstorms and blizzard conditions make things so much harder to see than in the first game. The trees being blown by storm winds, I mean, as someone who's probably the biggest sucker in the world for this kind of thing, I really appreciated this feature. At number 5, we've got the machines, the stars of the Horizon series. These robotic animals and dinosaurs are pretty much the best part of the series, and taking each of them down not only presents their own challenges, but it's the satisfaction when bringing down some of the bigger, more titanic machines that makes each encounter well worth it. Even if you're not properly prepared to deal with a certain machine just yet, it's still worth a try in my book. And said book also includes experimenting with the exact same gear multiple times in a row and expecting different results. Apparently, I'm a slow learner to realize what I'm doing doesn't work. Either that, I'm just incredibly stubborn. Yeah, it's probably that. But Forbidden West not only went bigger with machines like the Chaotic Sliverfang or the Aquatic Tide Ripper, which is based on a plesiosaur, aka the Loch Ness Monster, for those unaware. But the team also went with more unique animal inspirations, with the likes of a slaughter spine being a homage to Jurassic Park 3's Spinosaurus, mixed with a bit of Godzilla for good measure, or the Dreadwing being based on a bat that has the cloaking tech of a stalker, not to mention almost every machine from Zero Dawn makes a return albeit updated and also having a new, more deadly apex form. Even the ones from Frozen Wilds, you know, the hard ones like the Scorcher and the Fireclaw, and they're just as hard, if not harder. The only exceptions are the Tramplers, the Sawtooths, and the Deathbringers, 
as they don't make an appearance whatsoever. I guess for a location-based reason, it makes sense for the Tramplers, because the first game took place around or within the vicinity of Yellowstone National Park, where buffalo naturally live, while the second game takes place closer to the west coast of the US, which is not their natural habitat. I mean, come on, do I really have to dwell on details? They're robots for crying out loud, so it really shouldn't matter. And while the game's new machines are given much more personality, the returning machines weren't exactly given the same treatment despite their upgrades. Although, I will give them a pass for every tall neck in the game, as each one is such a unique and special experience. Like, these things are the gentlest machines in the entire series, so when one isn't functioning properly or simply not functioning at all, you kind of feel bad about not helping them, despite having to pull one down in order to fix its shields. But these situations just help create a special connection to these gentle giants, while making navigating around the map much easier. Overriding machines are still the same as the first game. You get them by completing the much improved and more challenging cauldrons, and then ultimately turn machines against each other. But I personally like sicking my claw striders on enemies instead, as it feels more like a team effort. And number six is the improved combat system. Now, just like Traversal, the team over at Gorilla put heavy emphasis on this before release, with melee combat seeing the biggest improvement in this area, as new combos can be unlocked via the new and improved skill tree, and practiced via the new training pits that are scattered throughout the map. Okay, there's actually only four of them on the map, but they were a real lifesaver when I came across much harder enemies in Rebel Camps. It definitely made the experience much better, I just wish I knew about this stuff sooner. But in addition to updated melee combat, you can chain your long-range weapons into the mix of combos, which in of itself is pretty satisfying. Even more so when you use the right Valor Surge, which are unlocked via the skill trees. I honestly like the one that uses Stalker Cloaking Tech to practically make Aloy invisible to any nearby enemy without the use of smoke bombs. Look, the Predators got nothing on Aloy at this point, but the skill trees are divided into six sections depending on your playstyle. But if you're like me, you're more than likely going to buy everything here just to make life as easy as possible, and even unlock some brand new weapon abilities like the ability to use the returning triple notch skill from Zero Dawn and switch to using the high volley skill, which fires free arrows into the air onto targets that might be behind cover. And funny story, at first I actually thought this was broken, as I was blindly unlocking things in the skill tree that I didn't realize until I was about halfway through the game and looked it up on Google that I could just use the left and right buttons on the D-pad with the weapon wheel open to switch between the two. Honestly, I felt pretty dumb for not realizing this sooner, but hey, we all make mistakes. But speaking of weapons, it seems Gorilla took a page out of Insomniac's book with the likes of the Ratchet and Clank series and maybe some Spider-Man as well. Not just because the weapon wheel can hold up to six weapons now or the fact a quick swap feature exists in the game, but it's the extended variety of weapons at Aloy's disposal this time around. One of my favorites are the Shredder Gauntlets, as it almost feels like a game of Frisbee in a way if getting hit by machines while catching the disc was a feature. And if you catch the disc three times, the fourth toss will do some massive damage on impact. Honestly, this reminds me of a Spiral of Death from the Ratchet and Clank series, which kind of functions in a similar way. But each of these weapons can help turn the tide in a fight, whether it be tearing off machine parts to disable certain abilities, trigger an elemental blast by hitting a weak spot, knocking them down, or simply building up damage with the new plasma type weapons. Forbidden West takes the formula even further by innovating Zero Dawn's already existing weave and coil system, which allowed you to make certain weapons deal more damage or build up elemental states faster. Now, it can be taken much further with various new weave and coil types like high ground damage, knockdown damage, etc., with the possibility of being able to combine various techniques at once 
to deal damage in the quadruple number range, maybe even higher. I mean, it's pretty crazy what anyone can do when they put in enough time to make the necessary upgrades and get the right stuff. But the increased draw speed bow coil, that's actually a bit ridiculous if you ask me. Almost as much as the varied ammo crafting times, just why? Can we just have it the way it was in Zero Dawn? That was already perfect. I don't know why these two things needed to be changed. Just please, can you restore it to how it was? And finally, at number seven, lots of brand new activities. I've already mentioned quite a few activities in this video, but truth be told, that was not all of them. I'll highlight the rest here, but they won't include collectibles. First, I'll mention the arena. This area gets unlocked once you get so far into the story and complete a quick side quest. Here, you can test your skills against a uniquely selected group of machines that you likely won't find anywhere else in the game, like a Thunderjaw and a Scorcher. That is a bad combination, but it's also a pretty cool tag team. Now, most of the challenges aren't a problem whatsoever, even on hard mode, provided you've got the right gear, but then there's the challenges where your gear is pre-selected, which completely suck if you're playing them on hard mode, because you'll be losing a lot. And I've lost way too many shards because of this, when they could have been used on other, more important things. Okay, to be fair, I was working my way to get medals to get some better armor and better weapons. But at this point, I made things easier on myself and set the difficulty to normal while doing the arena specifically the pre-selected gear challenges, simply to get past them. And the same goes for the Melee Pit's Pitmaster challenges. Those took much longer than they actually needed to be. Now, don't get me wrong, I like a good arena in games. Ratchet & Clank has plenty of them, and so does Spider-Man to an extent, if you count hideouts as arenas. So, Horizon fits right up there with them. And then there's the gauntlet runs, which are this game's version of racing. Racing is done on the back of machines. Ammo pickups and boosts are placed along the track to be used against opponents, to either stagger them or simply knock them off a machine. It's actually a really fun time all the way around, especially when you get the hang of things, as it's easily one of the most tense racing segments I've had in a game since Jack X and CTR Nitro Fueled. There's also an in-game board game called Machine Strike. Here, you're using pieces inspired by the machines that you see scattered around the game. Your goal is basically get seven victory points or simply wipe out all your opponent's pieces. It's a game that's complicated at first, but it's very easy to get addicted to. And it really helps that you can get better pieces from hunting grounds or by simply winning matches scattered throughout the various settlements, allowing you to get better with each one before becoming the ultimate king of strike. But I will admit that after a while, the charm of it does seem to wear off. Maybe it's because I played the game all the way through twice in a very short amount of time. However, playing against Eren doesn't seem to get old for some reason. I guess it has something to do with him being one of the series' main, but also best characters, which gives the impression you're playing a casual game with a friend, and seems so much better than playing with a bunch of random, very competitive people you literally just met, after coming into town like two minutes ago. I don't care if it's during the game's story, where you're on a very important, urgent mission, or if it's post-game after the final boss is defeated, it just don't sound right to me. But playing against Eren? Oh heck yeah man, I'll do that any day of the week. There's also the revamped Vista points, returning from Zero Dawn. This time around, they're more so about matching a partial image to the environment. It's not so much a puzzle, but it's the challenge of actually finding the right spot to line them up that's the fun part, even if a machine happens to be in the way. And the last notable activity that's worth mentioning is salvage contracts. Basically speaking, if you find a salvager out in the wilds, they'll give you a contract to hunt down certain machine parts, you go and knock the parts off before taking the machine down, otherwise they'll break and you cannot collect them. Grab the parts and bring them back to the person who gave you the contract and you'll get a nice reward. 
In addition to this, shooting off machine parts at any time is necessary to upgrade weapons and outfits, so they'll be able to withstand more types of damage as well as deal more damage to enemies in addition to the aforementioned weaves and coils. The problem is, this process can be a bit tedious at times, especially with flying machines like Stormbirds or Dreadwings and even Tide Rippers, which make things as hard as possible to get a good aim on certain parts. It can ruin the flow of just fighting a machine in the fastest and best way possible. Sure, some of the parts happen to be weak spots and disable certain attacks, so you might be aiming for those anyway, but focusing on those parts primarily, it does seem to take some of the fun out of it. So I eventually decided to set the difficulty to custom, just so I can turn on easy loot, making the game feel more like Zero Dawn, where I can focus on the fighting, and not worry so much about losing parts if I forgot to knock them off, or if I simply cannot reach them, then having to go who knows where to find another machine of the same type, on top of already having to go looking for other resources just to do any sort of upgrades, and then return to the nearest workbench after collecting said resources just so I can do any sort of upgrading. The workbench honestly feels like it takes up way more time than really necessary, even for ammo crafting, and that alone takes even longer than doing it in the weapon wheel. I don't know, if they can fix the overall ammo crafting speeds, bring back the long dodge skill from Zero Dawn, and maybe at least allow upgrades to the various pouches to be done anywhere in the game, like in Zero Dawn, and of course fix some of the other tiny issues here and there, then I think we'll have an improved experience all the way around. And here's hoping that we'll be getting a new game plus mode and some of that rumored DLC in the near future. But that's all I've got for today. If you stuck through the whole video, thank you so much. You're awesome. Don't forget to like, share, subscribe, and hit that bell notification icon for more content in the future. And also be sure to leave your thoughts and experiences with Horizon Forbidden West down in the comments section below. As always, I've been Blue Knight. Thank you all so much for watching and for always sticking around. I'll see you guys back here next time.